Rose Hill in northwest London. Um, but and I've lived in London for about 30 years, but I still don't consider myself a Londoner. Uh, I'm from the northwest of England, and I, I still feel very much uh, connected to the north of England. So although I lived in London, I don't think I'm a Londoner. Uh, what do I do for fun? I, I really struggle with that question, which makes me sound really sad. But I suppose it's because I try and make as much of my life fun as much of my life fun as possible. So um, you know, it's almost like I don't think, "Oh, this is fun," and this is not fun. But in terms of what I do outside, what we think of as work, then I guess I'm I'm quite introverted. I'm not a I'm not good in big groups of people, so I'm much more interested in good food and drink, listening to music. Uh, I've been a big sports fan all my life, especially cricket and uh, to some extent football. Uh, so you can't really come from where I come from without being a football fan. So those, I guess, are my, my fun things. And I love travel. I travel a lot and um, just enjoy you know, meet, being in other cultures and meeting other people. <laughs> I always wonder whether one finds yoga or whether you know, yoga finds you, but I think bribery came into it somewhere. I think it was a time when my, my partner said to me one day, you are so stiff. You're sitting behind a desk all day and driving the car and playing sport. We're going to go to a yoga class. And I sort of went, what? And I, I, I just have this recollection. She'll probably say I'm wrong, but I think there's a, I have a recollection that I'll take you out for dinner afterwards might have featured somewhere in the conversation. Uh, so she said to me, oh, we've, uh, I found this place called the Life Center in Notting Hill. We're going to go there on Saturday afternoon. So I said, okay. Um, so along we went and uh, I sort of got in the room and I thought, I have no idea what I'm doing here, but it seems like the done thing to do is to roll out one of these mats and lie down. So I did that. And, you know, you go through life and you have these sort of memories of events that stick in your head. And one of my memories is coming out of my first ever yoga class thinking, well, I couldn't do much, much, much of that, but wow, I enjoyed it. Actually, quite like to go back and do it again, and so I did, and I kept going back, and I kept doing it again, and there was a big sort of seminal moment, I guess, about it's probably about a year after that when I had a realization talking to a friend that yoga wasn't necessarily just something that you did once a week. You know, it was your seven o'clock Monday night or whatever it was thing that you did that it was actually okay to, you know, to practice more than once a week. Uh, and so I guess that was the time when I started going to classes more and more. I started going on holidays and retreats and weekends and stuff. And it, uh, that, for me, was when I think my whole life with yoga really got a kickstart. Like a lot of people, I think one of my biggest challenges uh, in practice always is finding enough time to do the practice I want to do. But having said that, the cornerstone of my practice for some time now has been seated meditation practice. Uh, I, I sit every day. Uh, if I don't do any other form of yoga practice in the day, I will always at least spend some time sitting. I suppose what I've come to realize through my practice generally, whether it's asana, pranayama, sitting, whatever it is, is that as I get older, I'm, quite, I'm more and more happy to keep it simple. I've, I, most of the time, anyway, I feel like I've got beyond the place where I feel, oh, I've got to do more and more complicated stuff. Uh, yeah, I've got to get my body into this particular shape, which it probably will never get into. Uh, and I suppose also my practice has become more internally focused. So I get less caught up in, in sort of the externals of some of the shapes that I'm trying to put my body into during asana practice and a little more interested in how I'm feeling and what little adjustments I could make perhaps to enhance that feeling. 
But it's it's just an ongoing process. It's an ongoing process. But the key part of it always, the anchor for me, is the, the meditation practice. I'm not sure it's a, a groundbreaking discovery or insight, but the more I study Indian thought and Indian tradition and Indian texts, and this is probably an observation that isn't specific to Indian texts, it's just that that's what I, what I happen to study, is the realization of how many people, or how people, not how many people, but how people always feel like they want to put their spin on interpretation. And I guess that's sort of inevitable. It's what we all probably do. When we read something, when we look at something, we, we bring our own preconceptions to our interpretation. But something that one sees perhaps particularly in the Upanishads, and I don't want to go into too much laborious detail, but the tendency to look at the Upanishads, find an argument that supports your particular perspective and say, okay, this is the teaching of the Upanishads. When, to be honest, more often than not, it's actually a teaching of the Upanishads. What the Upanishads do is they ask an awful lot of questions and they don't necessarily just give one answer to those questions. They give a number of different answers. And I sort of relate that a little bit to to my yoga or to, to yoga as it's developing in the, in the West, which is in the way that I sometimes wonder how many yoga teachers, even quite experienced yoga teachers, really go back to some of the source texts of yoga and really understand what they're saying. It, it seems to me very often that teachers, and I don't mean this to be a criticism of all yoga teachers, it's certainly not that, but the teachers sometimes they say, oh, well, yeah, yoga says X, Y, Z. And in saying yoga says X, Y, Z, there's perhaps a, a sort of neglecting of the fact that the yoga tradition has changed. There isn't one yoga philosophy. There isn't one yoga tradition. Yoga's been around for... You know, on a conservative estimate, a couple of thousand years. Uh, and through that time, the underlying philosophies have changed, the practices have changed, and they continue to change. Yet, I still have a sense, perhaps, perhaps I'm wrong in this, but I have a sense that a lot of teachers who say, oh yeah, I teach Hatha Yoga, for example, they may say that without ever really, even knowing their way around the Hatha Yoga Padipika, which is the main text of Hatha Yoga, let alone having studied any of the other Hatha Yoga texts. So, I, I guess the long-winded answer to your question is that one thing I'm really coming to realize through my studies is that there are so many questions raised in the Indian tradition. And there are not necessarily a single answer. And one of the things I'm trying to show in my thesis is how different people have taken different teachings and perhaps put them on a pedestal to the exclusion of other important teachings. I guess I'm going to throw one in. I have to throw this one in. The, the preconception that often gets spun around that Yoga is not for men. Um, I, I don't think that's such a, a huge preconception. I think it's one that's weakening a lot. But it is still the case, of course, that in any given yoga class, probably the majority of participants, maybe the large majority of participants, will be female. Um, and I guess that's also kind of sad. And I think those two preconceptions that... You know, yoga, can, yoga is a little bit of a wishy-washy form of exercise. And yoga is not for men. And I tend to get... They, they, they relate to each other. They're linked to each other. Uh, and again, I think that's kind of sad. And I think as men uh, get into yoga practice, they realize 
that you know why why shouldn't I be here? But sometimes there seems to be that extra extra step to take to bring guys into yoga practice, which, as I say, I think is kind of sad. So I was lucky that the bribery worked for me when I started out. <laughs> the first thing I think to say to that what is that. Mm. I continue to learn from my students all the time. Uh, they're, they're, it sounds a little bit, a little bit pompous, but you know, they are our most important teachers as yoga teachers. And I suppose the single most important thing that I've learned from, from my students is the importance of recognizing each individual as being unique as being different, that not only is everybody's body different, of course, but everybody comes to yoga practice with that sort of like unique combination of what they were born with and what they've acquired during their lives in terms of physical baggage, mental baggage, emotional baggage. And the importance as teachers of recognizing and honoring that in our students uh, and realizing, for me, the importance is realizing that there should never be a, a one-size-fits-all approach to yoga. Because, as, you know, as I've just said, everybody is, is unique on all sorts of different levels. Now, of course, in a... In a group class, there has to be a sense of well, we're going to do this and see how you get on with it. But um, even teaching a group class, it's so important as a teacher to be able to respond to what you perceive to be your student's reaction to what you're teaching. And yeah, I think that's the single greatest thing, that the, the acknowledgement that each individual is different and that we... We can come to teaching, we can come to classes knowing exactly how we respond to any given posture, breathing practice, meditation practice, whatever it is. But how we respond is so totally different to how some other people will respond. And having the, I suppose you could even call it the humility to Acknowledge and respect that for me is so important. Practice. <laughs>